All right. Hey, YouTube. Welcome to my old office. It's empty and pretty banged up. But I did have great plans for this thing. Originally, I was going to turn it into a studio where I and whoever else in the office could use it to record videos whenever we wanted. But then the pandemic hit, the world went into lockdown, and I never got to complete it. That being said, I did just kick off a YouTube channel, so I feel like now might be a good time to finally follow through. So, in my fervor to do just that, I went to my storage unit and I picked up my entire physical magic library. Ta-da! It's not that big. It's like two really big boxes chock full of books. But as I was going through them, I realized just how many of these books drastically affected the way that I not only think about magic, but about the world in general. And one of those books really, really grew on me. Sharps and Flats by John Neville Maskelin, a complete revelation of the secrets of cheating at games of chance and skill. Originally published in 1894, it ended up being one of the most popular books on the subject of gambling and cheating exposés. And John Neville Maskelin was one of the premier performers of his era, so it carried a lot of weight. But this wasn't the only book of its kind, and John Neville Maskelin wasn't the only great performer to ever write a book like it. Robert Houdin released an exposé on cheating some 30 years before this book was ever published. But this one was far more popular for a very, very good reason. Where Robert Houdin's book talks about what might be happening while someone is cheating, John Neville Maskelin goes into very great detail with pictures about how someone might be cheating. But that can be sort of a problem. You see, this book was originally published to have the common man defend himself against the nefarious means of the cheater. But if you go into too much detail, it can function more like an instruction manual for someone trying to get into swindling people, which it kind of did. Now, whether on balance this book was used for more good or ill is still up for debate. But the story of John Neville Maskelin and the dynasty that he started is pretty intriguing. And there's something in the middle of this book that in my mind helped shape the course of history. Let me tell you what I mean. Okay, so let's get a couple of things straight about John Neville Maskelin. Number one, he was the start of a minor dynasty in magic. His son, Neville Maskelin, was a famous illusionist and the co-author of the book Our Magic. Incidentally, he was also the first wireless hacker. We'll go over that in a sec. John Neville Maskelin's grandson, Jasper Maskelin, has the affectionate moniker the War Magician because he was part of the British war effort in North Africa during World War II. Also, we'll go over that in a sec. But John Neville Maskelin was born toward the end of the Industrial Revolution and the beginning of the Scientific and Technological Revolution. So he got to be on both sides of the coin. He had the Victorian era performance mystique, but it was very common for performers like him to also incorporate giant scientific oddities into their shows because they were so awe-inspiring. But the other thing that they were famous for was debunking charlatans. There was a giant spiritualist movement that was going on around the same time, and people like him and Harry Houdini made careers out of debunking these people. But they also made a fight to debunk the cheater as well, exposing their methods and hopefully defending the common man against their horrible ways. See, Dear John made his bones by debunking a couple of spiritualists known as the Davenport Brothers. And about 20 years before this book was released, he released a book about spiritualism and debunking a bunch of charlatans in it. But then he decides to throw his hat in the ring and try to defend the common man against the cheater and publishes Sharps and Flats. But he had something going for him that most people didn't. He didn't just talk about the methods, he talked about the tools. John Neville Maskelin originally trained as a watchmaker, so gadgets were his thing. And this book goes into great detail not only about the methods and examples of gambling, but also the apparatuses that were used, including holdouts. He was one of the first people to ever do that. But there's one phrase in the middle of this book that is a game changer. It can always be detected. Nevertheless, by the different sound made by a card when brought from the bottom, there's just a slight click, which is distinctly audible and easily recognized. It's a tiny phrase. But what he's talking about there are false deals, the second deal and the bottom deal. It's just a tiny part of a section in the middle of the book called Manipulation, where he goes over how a card cheat might manually manipulate the outcome of a game. But he's doing something that, as far as I know, he's one of the first to do. He called out the audible aspect of a cheating move. So that way, even if you couldn't see what was going on when someone was making a false deal, you might catch them by the sound that they make. The reason a false deal makes a different sound is because of a difference in friction and execution. 
When you're dealing off the top, it might make a sound because it scrapes along the top of the deck and maybe your fingertips and clicks off and then falls to the table. But if you were dealing seconds, that's up to twice the friction because of everything that gets in the way. And if you're dealing bottoms, even more so, right? Because now you're dealing with the friction of the deck plus potentially your entire hand. So now let's play a game of spy versus spy. Let's imagine that you yourself are on the other side of this coin. You're a professional card cheat in 1894, and you find out that the world famous John Neville Maskelyne has released a book giving away your entire craft to the general populace. And you don't know who will read it, who will study it, and who will take it seriously. So you do the smart thing, you pick up a copy, you get to the section on manipulation and find out that he's called out the audible aspect of your false deal, and now you have a problem. You've got two choices. You can either now refine your false deal to the point where it is absolutely indistinguishable from your regular deal, either by sight or by sound. Or you go in the other direction, and you screw with your regular deal so much that you could hide a false deal in it and no one would be the wiser, effectively hiding the signal of your cheating in the noise of your regular deal. But the best in the world did both at the same time and created what we call an auditory illusion. So now you, dear card cheat, are a year past the publication of Sharps and Flats. The year is now 1895 and you're at a table with a number of people and you don't know if any of them have read this book or taken it seriously. So your only defense is to create an auditory illusion to test the table. As you go around dealing fairly off the top of the deck, intermittently you will create a false, false deal by allowing your top deal to look or sound off. And you do this continuously to see if it raises any suspicions. If it doesn't, then you have raised the tolerance of discrepancy and lowered the general scrutiny of the game, allowing you to false deal to your heart's content because you have hidden the signal in the noise. But if it does raise suspicions, you're no worse off because you were dealing on the square. Any advantage that anyone had was pure happenstance at the order of the shuffled deck, and your auditory illusion has saved you the embarrassment of being killed, or worse yet, caught. So what does all this signal and the noise and auditory illusions have to do with the Masculines and their legacy? Well, for John Neville Masculine, honestly, not much. After the publication of Sharps and Flats, he still spent the rest of his life fighting the influence of charlatans and cheaters on the general populace. But weirdly enough, so did his son, Neville Masculine. Neville was just as much of a performer and technologist as his father. The Masculines owned a concern in the telegraph world, the only form of long distance communication at the time but they were playing with all of the latest technologies, including wireless communication. And then comes along Marconi, the purported inventor of radio. And he says that wireless communication is not only better than the telegraph, but also more secure, which makes him, in Neville's eyes, a charlatan. And he set out to debunk Marconi. When Marconi made the dubious claim that wireless communication was more secure, he was basing it on the fact that all the messages came over a signal on a particular frequency. And if you didn't have your instruments tuned to the same frequency, you weren't receiving anything. But what if you just tuned your device through all of the available frequencies? Eventually you could find the message and hear it just as easily as the person who it was intended for. And more importantly, you could interrupt the receiver from receiving the message by creating a broad spectrum signal strong enough to interrupt the message coming through at the receiver's end. So that's exactly what Neville did. He added noise to the signal. So Marconi is set to demonstrate the prowess of wireless communication to the Royal Institute in Great Britain. And shortly before his message is supposed to arrive from the sender at the tower there, Neville sends out a broad spectrum message to the same receiving tower that Marconi's message is supposed to arrive at. And the message that he sends is essentially a poem making fun of Marconi. Now, Marconi's message does in fact arrive, and it proves the prowess of the distance that wireless communication can happen at, but it deeply embarrasses Marconi and his claims of security. And it forced wireless communication to become significantly stronger. And this became very important because the world was about to enter two world wars. 10 years after the Marconi demonstration, World War I breaks out, and we find out the fragility of wired communication. All the enemy has to do is cut your lines and they cut you off from the rest of the world. And wireless communication proves its prowess because even if everyone can hear what you're saying, at least your message for help gets through. Now the Maskelines were also suffering. John Neville Maskelyne passes away in 1913, just before the outbreak of World War I. And though Neville had done an exceptional job of carrying forward the Maskelyne name, he passes away shortly after World War I in 1924. But they are survived by Neville's son, Jasper. Jasper Maskelyne is the final man of the Maskelyne Magic Dynasty. 
He is a performer extraordinaire, just like his father and grandfather. He's very much into science and technology, just like they were, but he's not the same businessman. And that's likely because he inherited the dynasty when he was 22. Neville Maskelyne passes away in 1924, which means that Jasper has to maintain it all the way through the Roaring Twenties and well into the Great Depression. And he's forced in the 30s to make ends meet by selling off a lot of the business concerns that the Maskelynes had acquired. But then World War II breaks out and he is recruited by the British Army to be part of the camouflage unit in North Africa. British intelligence actually advertised the fact that they had recruited Jasper, because wouldn't you want to be on the side that had a wizard on it? His involvement in the camouflage unit only lasted for about a year, and then he went on to perform for the troops for the remainder of the war. But what he was a part of is so important because the Allies used artists and designers and magicians to develop deceptive tactics as a defense in a war that they likely would have lost without all of that an effort that we call the Ghost Army. Remember how I said in the beginning, if you want to hide a false steal, you had two options. You could either refine it to the point where no one could tell the difference between the real deal and the fake deal, or you could go in the other direction. You could mess with your real deal so much, make it so loud or noisy or chaotic that no one had a baseline for comparison between what's real and what's fake. That's what they did. And one of the best tactics that they used was auditory illusions, and they did it in two ways. The world went wireless, Marconi won, and it has all of the same issues that he advertised it wouldn't have. Anyone can listen in if you have the right frequency. They thought they had it cracked by adding encryption, but both sides developed armies of people to decrypt messages, so that wasn't reliable. But the Allies realized something very, very important. Messages are sent by people, and people have mannerisms and ticks and timing that is unique to them, and the people intercepting those messages know that but we had to convince the world that we were going to be somewhere other than Normandy on D-Day. So they did that by sending that style of message in the style of a real person with all of the same tics and mannerisms and timing. The second auditory illusion was the ghost army itself. They were placed in positions that had to be defended, but the allies didn't have enough people to be everywhere important at once. So the ghost army was placed there with, I'm not kidding you, inflatable tanks and speakers with libraries of recordings. But those recordings were of real tanks going uphill and downhill and across fields. They were recordings of men marching and laughing and chatting and checking their guns. And their job was to convince the opposing side that there was an entire army of very real people and very real tanks just waiting for them. And it worked! And the Allies won World War II. And to think, all of this spawned from a couple of sentences in sharps and flats. That's why I love this book so much, is yes, because of what's in it, but also the implications and the family that was involved in all of it. So I realized that was long-winded. I hope that you found that interesting. If there are any other really cool historical subjects that you think I might find interesting, let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, I'll see you guys soon.